everybody, and welcome to the Everything VoiceOver Podcast. My name is Justin D. Torres, and uh, the Everything VoiceOver Podcast is brought to you by The Voice Realm, where only professional voice actors are listed. Today, uh, we're going to talk about some interesting stuff. We're going to talk about all the things that nobody talks about in voiceover. Now, these are going to be aspects about, like, health care and, like, uh, certain mentalities and, uh, you know, a little bit about my experience with agents and whatnot and, uh, you know, just a bunch of little aspects that no one really talks about because there's been a lot of uh, pay-to-play site, um, you know, critiques that have been happening as of recently because of the, the voice bank merger. And it seems like there's just a consistent opinion that's out there and a lot of thing a lot of people don't talk about other aspects of the union and the the initiation fees that I think you really need to know about because you know you want to have different sides of the the coin because it's very clear that the, there's a specific opinion out there but we need to know what is going on as far as like the reasons why people don't join the union or the reasons why the union isn't helping certain certain aspects of the voiceover community um, so, uh, what we're going to do is this is going to be a two part series because when I started writing this thing, it took forever and I didn't realize that it would be this long. So this is going to be a two part series. This is going to be part one. And in part one, we're going to take on a little bit of like how my experience started, uh, how my first union job ended up happening and the fees that came with that. And then, uh, you know, maybe a little bit about the, uh, the healthcare aspect of uh, of joining the union, and maybe a little bit about the the mentality that comes that's been prevalent in the voiceover community at this very moment. Um, well, so let's go with a quick mini story about how I started getting into voiceover, and it's going to be really quick. So hopefully, we'll get to the good stuff, so you can compare your notes to mine. Um, first of all, when I got into New York City, I started taking classes. I took one-on-ones with Dorian Elliott, who is a casting director at Phantom Audio. She is amazing and a top-notch voiceover coach. If you're in New York, I would recommend seeing her or just starting some starting uh, starting taking one-on-one classes with her. She is amazing. Um, definitely helpful in all all aspects. I got my demo made from Phantom Audio with Dorian Elliott. She is spectacular and and that's a really great demo that I that I used to get into uh, my agency and then I went to a class called shut up and talk and that was uh, with uh, Roger Becker at the time who and then and then as the end of the class happened Roger actually recommended me to go to access talent now access talent is a voiceover only agency and they are spectacular they're run by some amazing people I I've always had a great time with them I'm no longer with them anymore because I started getting less and less auditions and I was really kind of scared to get into the, the union because and I'll tell you more about that later and uh, Access Talent signed me and they set me out on auditions. Now my experience was the first few months I got maybe a one audition a week, maybe two, but I wasn't pulling anything and I wasn't doing, I wasn't getting even callbacks. So that's, you know, the skill has to be there. You can't just get onto an audition, an agent and suddenly be able to pull jobs. Uh, I ended up getting a job by phone. They called me up. I did the audition by phone and I was also sick at the time too. And then I got pulled into the studio, and then I started doing the work, which was great. I think it was a non-union work, but it was good. And then I got replaced 10 minutes in. Oh, it was horrible. Um, after that, I was still with uh, Access, still believed in me. And uh, I ended up getting a couple of audiobooks. I did the audiobooks for the 100 and a couple of other audiobooks in studio. And I ended up doing a whole lot of children's books, and that was that was great. That was amazing, and uh, you know that ended up being my gig for quite a while. Just uh, an audiobook here and there, maybe one audiobook every three months or so, and then like a children's book here and there. And uh, during my first year there, I ended up getting one job that was big, and that was a Dairy Queen spot that ran in the South. It was for the five buck Chuck deal. And I ended up, and when I got the check for it, because they, this was weird, because I, I had no idea what scale rate was, and I know I had no idea. I was just happy to get a spot, a, a, an actual, an actual job. I ended up getting about seven hundred, maybe eight hundred dollars for the actual spot itself, and then I got like three hundred dollars every six months for about, for about twice, I think, maybe three times, and I was like. Oh, that's that's good. It's good money. It's definitely good money. But I was like thinking, like, oh, I thought, I thought a, a s- scale, or at least when I first finally hit my television <laughs> voiceover, that would be like thousands of dollars. But it didn't. It was it was small. 
But, you know, I, how did I how did I make money otherwise? Well, I supplemented it with I had a non-union VO agent along with Access, who was my union VO agent. And they sent me out for stuff and they sent me out for even less auditions. I didn't get anything, anything there. I, I had a, non a non-union commercial agent and I got a few small on-screen gigs there, here and there. And that was fun. But I really never really made enough money to, to pay the rent with, with those few jobs. And this was in the span of about three years. So I'm not, uh, by uh, union estimation, I am not good. <laughs> so, um, and as time went on, I still did the occasional audiobook. And uh, yeah, and I would do a trip up north every couple of months, every two months, and do a round of children's book. Now, pay-wise, for those gigs, audiobooks was an average about $200 to $300 per hour in studio, and I did about four or five hours for the audiobooks. And then Dairy Queen uh, was probably a little over a grand, and then the children's books would be about 200 to 300 per hour in the studio. Now, this was a span of about maybe two to three years, so I'd get an occasional audiobook, a children's book, and then an audition or two for co commercials um, a month. And as time went on, I would get less and less uh, walk-in auditions for, for jobs because I wasn't pulling, and I have no blame towards Access Talent. They, they, definitely, they definitely put, initially, I was getting about two auditions a week, but I wasn't pulling, so why would they send me out? And then occasionally I started getting online auditions where they were sending me like a script and saying, can you get this done tonight? And I would do it and I never pulled anything from there. And uh, that was now, now mind you, this is my experience. This is just my experience. It's, it could be a fluke. Uh, I do think that there are similar people in the similar situations than I was where they got into the union and suddenly they stopped getting, or they got into an agency and they suddenly stopped getting jobs or they weren't pulling the jobs that were there. Now, there's a million reasons for that. You know, there's networking, there's people who are better than me, or there's just people with a different type of sound than me. Or maybe I was nervous the whole time because walking into an in-studio audition is different than doing an audition from home. So who knows? You know, and, and, and as I started growing uh, my non-union voiceover stuff, um, I realized that my, not, my union situation was, was actually not, not that great. And, and I was getting to the point where if I did one or two more jobs for the union, they would, they would say, you can't do any more jobs unless you join the union. So, so I was scared about that. And this happened recently, about three or four months ago, when I wasn't really receiving hardly any auditions anymore. And I thought to myself, hey, if uh, I find myself dreading getting that last job because I know I haven't been pulling uh, all these three or four years um, for, for union jobs. And if I do, just by by luck, pull a union job, and then the next one comes around, and they're like, you have to be union. I, I can't afford it. And I also was making so much with non-union voiceover that I was like, oh, I I need to, to pay my bills. I need to eat food. So I, out of fear, I was just like, I, I ended up leaving Access Talent and saying, I can't join the union. I want to try and build my non-union situation here. It's already doing very well. I just can't join the union at this moment. And we parted ways, and I... And I and I love Access Talent. And if you're ever in town and you and you get an opportunity to work with them, they are amazing people and good people as well. Speaking of good people, the uh, Everything Voiceover Podcast is brought to you by the Voice Realm, where only professional voice actors are listed. Now, here's a uh, a couple of pieces of information that I learned the hard way, and and not really the hard way, but I just. Uh, you know, no one ever talked about it. No one ever talked about these kind of uh, pieces of information. And, you know, I think people should know these things before they start working on voiceover stuff and then f before they start, you know, doing the forging your path into voiceover and try and go, f try and go for an in-studio voiceover or be a home studio voiceover. So first off, the union, to be in SAG-AFTRA, which is the union for voiceover people, it used to be just regular AFTRA, but now it's SAG-AFTRA. In order to get into the union, you have to pay an initiation fee of three thousand dollars. Now the dues per year are around two hundred dollars, but the initiation fee is three thousand dollars. <throat> now they have a two to three union job limit before you're forced to join. My job initially for Dairy Queen was about thirteen hundred dollars, and so I pulled that. So I would have to pull that job about two more times to be able to pay off the initiation fee. But then again, I would not be able to use that money for you know. As, as like a job, it would have to be like a, a savings for my initiation fee. Now also, the agent takes about 10% off, and if you have a manager, they take about 10% off, and also on top of that is your, your uh, um, taxes, which takes off another 
20 or so percent. So after that, $1,300 quickly turns into maybe 900, 800. So technically, if I was going to do that job over and over again, I'd have to do it maybe five times, maybe four times to be able to pay off the initiation fee. So it's very interesting because it, it, it almost means that you have to, if you're going to do scale, you're definitely going to be taking it out of pocket, which is tough. You know, I mean, like we're not making that much money if we're voiceover artists. Um, yeah. And here's another thing. Do not expect that the scale wages for voiceover once you hit the agent market will be a huge increase versus the higher end of non-union VO as far as money wise. And there's a lot of way, uh, ways non-union VO is more work, yeah, there's a lot more words and whatnot, and there's no residuals, but it, it can be lucrative if you're looking, if you're comparing the high-end non-union voiceover market to the, to the low-end union market, they're definitely similar, and sometimes non-union is much more lucrative uh, as far as those go. Now, the scale rate for radio starts at about like 300 and then like 400 on top of that for the single spot. So you're starting at about 700 or so. And the scale rate for television starts at around 500 and then you get an $800 uh, on top of that. So like just by starting, just by getting into the studio, you make a couple hundred bucks. And if you're lucky enough to get into the national and a 13 week run of radio would get you about $1,500 on top of the session itself and the spot. So that's a lot. The rates are very good, but it should be clear that the three union jobs you pull, the initiation will take a majority of that money. And you, unless, unless of course you hit a, a great union job, a great not national right off the bat, and then you're just living off residuals. And those are like the lottery ticket of voiceover jobs and you'll have a shot at them. But if you don't pull them, it kind of doesn't make any sense, you know? Now, um, let's go into healthcare. Now this is huge. I mean, the one major difference between any union and non-union thing is the healthcare issue. There's, uh, this is, no one really talks about what what their situation is. Everyone talks about pay-to-play sites and whatnot, but no one's talking about health care. In order, once you turn union, once you pay the $3,000 and you're doing the $200 a year, in order to be eligible for health care, you have to make $17,000 for the lower end health care and $33,000 for the higher end plan. Now let's take a look at how that would work. If you're solely doing voiceover, some people do three or four different things, and that's amazing. The average actor here is definitely a voice actor, and when I'm talking about New York, the average actor is a voice actor, a film actor, a TV actor, they're, they're doing everything. Now let's take a look at how that would work for the voiceover actor. The average scale job would net you about, say, 1500 and that's kind of generous because I'm not taking off the, the taxes and whatnot, and then the manager and whatnot. So, um... You should be able to do at least like 10 to 15 jobs per year in voiceover or 30 jobs per year if you want to make the higher end. Now remember, there are big jobs. There are huge jobs and nationals that can pull you, that can pay off everything for the next four or five years. That's what everyone wants. I can honestly tell every single person listening to this that if you get one of those, congratulations, you're going to be set for a while. But if you don't pull it, which is a majority of people will not pull it, you know, you'd have to do the other jobs, you know, the little smaller jobs until that works out. Now, I would get maybe two auditions per week for my agent at best. There are people out there, there's more success. If you hit something early, uh, work begets work, work. So if you get something early, your agent will put you out maybe two or three times uh, more. So I know people who've done three, four auditions a day, and they're really successful. And also, just from a numbers standpoint, if you can convince your agent to send you out three to four times a day for like five days a week, then your ratios go up because you are getting more chances at gigs, and then you'll actually start pulling a couple of gigs. I have no doubt that if I had four to five auditions a, a day, I'd probably be able to pull some of those because, you know, just the act of auditioning in studio, I'd be better at it. But, <clears throat> you know, if... Uh, you're going to have to pull some jobs and and you know I tried to find I tried to find a uh, uh an, a figure to see how many sag afters make enough to be eligible for healthcare. And uh, now I know that there's a similar deal that I, and this is just a personal uh observation of mine for for people for friends. I used to do theater a while ago and <clears throat> There was a couple of equity actors that would be on stage with me uh, when I was non-union, 
And they would be like, they would, I would ask them about what's like to be equity. And they would say like, oh, in order for, it's like, in order for me to make, make, uh, enough to, to get, uh, healthcare, I have to do a couple of stage directing gigs a year because I'm also a stage director. And, and it wasn't because they, and I honestly, like, these are amazing actors. I've had, I'm a huge fan of every equity actor I've worked with. And it was just that there wasn't enough gigs. There wasn't enough equ- equity jobs out there. And I have a sneaking suspicion that it's the same with SAG after actors and voiceover, that there's just not enough jobs out there. And that, and that uh, you know, in turn, there's a lot less people getting their health care, getting the minimum, the, the minimum for health care. Now, um, now... Now, here, here's what I'm trying to get at. And it's like, I'm, am I saying that you can't do this? It's like, absolutely not. But it's kind of a gamble. I mean, you want to be the voice of Verizon. I want to be the voice of Verizon. Once you are, you're set and you don't have anything to worry about. But if you don't pull that job, and what if you tried for a couple of years and you never got it? Just like me. What do you do? You know, it's something to think about. Why is SAG after so expensive? If you're a plumber, the the union fee for uh, being a plumber is $1,000, and plumbers make a decent amount of money. So, you know, I mean, like, I always, I try and think, and I, and I know this is a bad thing to say, but I wonder, since they're making so much money off of an initiation fee, how many people, how many SAG people have, have made enough money to make back their initiation fee? Initiation fee is $3,000. That's, that's about, well, if, if you were looking at a pay-to-play site, that's, that's about 10 years of pay-to-play sites. And, uh, and that's, I've made a lot more money back from the pay-to-play sites than I've made for, if, I, if I start doing SAG after. Just from a, just, and, I, and I know for a fact that I'm not pulling SAG after just by the statistics of my personal experience. Now, uh, let's, let's go ahead and go into the last piece of the puzzle to finish off part one here. And this is this whole piece of the pie mentality. It's like, you're the voice, you're the talent, you have the microphone, you do the editing, so you should have the biggest piece of the pie. It's like, you're the Brad Pitt of this film, so you should probably get some more money out of it. Now, unfortunately, I just told you the scale rates, and this should, the scale rate should tell you the exact opposite. A company, a company like Dairy Queen only has to pay you the scale rate to use your voice. A company, a company like Nike only has to pay you scale rate and a few grand to get your voice for a few months on a national. Now this is the whole setup initially, and your agent is supposed to negotiate for better pricing and whatnot. And um, but it's I, I liken it to a band. Um, the uh, most bands out there make n- near nearly nothing when it comes to the. Uh, to the album itself. They make n- almost n- nothing from that. But if if they make if the the album goes like platinum and people love them, once they go on tour, then they can negotiate a rate and take a piece of the pie and make a lot of money off of their tour and off of their off of their um off of their merchandise and whatnot. So that's how they make money. Now I I, I liken it to voiceover in that you yeah, you may work with the company for the uh, Nike for like one big national but when they come back for you for the next three or four you can negotiate for a higher rate but the initial rate is going to be scale unless you have some kind of real amazing voice that no one can ever see um the scale you're always going to start at scale so um yeah and you can always negotiate but you have to start at scale now who gets a piece of the pie in a union job well, the, the piece of your pie, this is the piece of the pie that's been segmented out for you, 10% goes to the agent, uh, 10% goes to the manager, if you have one, and taxes-wise, takes out an extra, like, 30%. Now, that's only the piece of the pie that was allotted to you. The whole piece of the pie mentality is saying that, oh, yeah, this is a huge company, they should be able to give you more money. So, with that argument, um, we're talking about the piece of the entire pie. Like, what is the entire pie? What is, what is Nike's entire piece of pie? So, um, so who else is taking... So, what's the pieces? Well, you've got... If you're doing it in studio, you've got an engineer. You've got the studio space itself. He gets a piece. The, the studio, if it's owned by the production studio, they get a piece. If there's an editor, gets a, that's a big piece there. Um, the, you know, the... 
the creatives who wrote the script gets a piece. The came up with the people who came up with the idea get a huge piece. Um, the visuals, if they have animation or B-roll or other actors or you know pictures and branding or like the idea of what the what the actual campaign is about. Whole advertising agencies get a huge piece. So if you're looking at what Xerox put in their budget for a commercial, you are an extremely small portion of that entire pie. Uh, because by the time you're in there doing the voice acting, a majority of the work is done. The majority of the work is, there's so many people working on the project besides you. And a lot of those people are making a lot more money than you are. And that's unfortunate. And no one really talks about that because everyone's like, oh, you should be paid. That's a thousand dollar job. You should be paid this. So that's, that's, who's, who's this company for? Is that for Amazon? Well, it should be. A, that's a million dollar company. It should be this much. Well, no one, we don't know. The, the actual budget for the process, and we don't know who's getting paid what, and we don't know who's, who's getting a piece of the pie. And believe me, and, and, and every single person on that line wants a bigger piece of the pie. Every single person. And if you don't want to do it for this specific amount of money that you, that you are asking for, then you can give it to somebody else. Or you could negotiate and say, I want this bigger uh, part of the pie. That's the good thing about certain pay-to-play sites is that they tell you, Hundred dollars to two hundred fifty. I'll be like two hundred fifty. Yes, this is a big job. I want, I want to get some more money. If it's like a thousand to three thousand dollar job, and you're like, oh, this is a national. I'm taking my three thousand dollars for this. Do it. Now let's 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 look at pay to play sites for a second. If you're looking at a hundred dollar job, there's sometimes even lower. Or if you're on the high end of like two hundred to seventy five dollars, it's it's lower than scale. However, you've added an extra middleman. Now who gets a piece of those pies? You know, the, the pay-to-play site pies. Well, you, do, you don't have an agent, you don't have a manager, and taxes are definitely being taken out. But the pay-to-play site is acting as an agent. They are the middleman. They find people who need voiceover, they are charging for their service. Some pay-to-play sites have escrow, escrow your money and charge for that service. And if you use PayPal, they charge for that service. And that's just your piece of the pie. And now what, what do you think is above that? Well, some agents use pay-to-play sites to hire. I, I, I had actually done a, uh, a call-in where an agent was on the line and the client was on the line, and I mistakenly referred to Voices.com, and the guy was, like, not happy about that. He t- sent me a text afterwards, and I had to t- explain to him. I was like, you need to tell me that before I come into the service, that this is some kind of way for you to show that you're, <laughs> the way for you to show that you're not using a pay-to-play site. So, you know, there are agents out there that use pay-to-play sites there to, to try and get more to, more, to try and reach more talent. And, you know, we are just a cog of a production studio or a, co- a company, and we're a cog of a, of a campaign, uh, uh, you know, a campaign for a product. So by the time it gets to you, it's, it's been sliced down to very little. Now, do I like this? Am I... Um, am I Am I seriously, uh, uh, you know, pumped about this? No, absolutely not. I wish, I wish we could be part of the entire process. Unfortunately, I do realize how important every other piece of that process is. I'm not a campaign manager. I'm not an advertising agent. I'm not a, I don't run a, uh, you know, I'm not an audio engineer. You know, I mean, like, the uh, when it comes to non-union stuff, it, the pay is much lower. But when it comes to union stuff, it pays higher, but it's also you're getting... You're getting, you know, roughly similar rates, money-wise. So, anyway, that's been part one of the, you know, the, the things nobody tells you in voiceover. Uh, next, uh, next couple of days, I'll pull out the, 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 uh, the amazing perpetuity. Uh, I'll go into that when it comes to non-union versus union. And then a couple of very interesting things I found out about union actors and non-union actors and people moonlighting as as other as one or the other just to try and try and make a, extra money. And that's a big aspect of voiceover that no one really talks about as well. And it definitely does exist. And, you know, in conclusion, it's, this is not about, for this particular session, I'll, I'll do another in conclusion next session, but this is not about trying to convince you not to do voiceover, or not to join union, or not to do anything like that. This is just to try and convince you that you need to kind of forge your own path, and, and don't let anybody tell you you can or cannot do something to try and figure out how to get into voiceover. If I was going the in-studio studio route, and I decided that that I failed there and that I would never do voiceover again, I would not be dealing with the thousands of companies that I deal with, 
you know, over the last four or five years that that I've created stuff that I've that my that my voice is going to be on in GameStop somewhere, you know, doing 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 Nintendo stuff. I mean, if if I would have given up back then, you know, because I wasn't you know good enough by the certain standards of New York City, you know, I wouldn't be here today talking to you. I wouldn't have created everything Voiceover.com. So when you go out there, don't let anyone tell you what the hell to do. You go out there and you forge your own path. And you realize that, you know, that, you know, it's, it's pie in the sky stuff when it comes to union stuff. And if you do get in and you kill it, amazing. You are, I, I wish you all the luck. And if you don't do well, there's other ways. There's other ways to go about it. Go through the non-union voiceover route. Go through the home studio route. You can do that as well. And there's, you know, there's no, don't let anyone tell you how or what you should or shouldn't do. Don't let anyone try and, you know, in the same aspect of voiceover being like people saying like, hey, d- d- buy my PDF. Uh, it'll tell you how to do voiceover correctly. It's like in the same aspect, don't let, you know, you can take advice, but in, in the end, it's going to be how you sound and the work that you put in and the commitment you have and your positivity. And, you know, don't bring anyone else down and don't, you know, don't feel bad. Like I've like this is one thing I've been dealing about dealing with recently. Is like I look at I look at I had to leave a couple of Facebook sites because I felt bad for doing what I do, and it's like you know what? No, I'm not going to feel bad. I am living the best life I've ever lived. I'm dealing with voiceover on every every single day. I I deal with clients and I'm happy, and that's worth a million dollars to me. And if at some point in my life I graduate again to the agency route and I start doing even better there, so be it. But at the moment, I am not going to, I am at this point in my life where this voiceover is huge for me. And you're going to get that point and it's going to be a stepping stone and you're going to do well and you're going to fail and you're going to do well. You just need to keep hacking at it because you can do it and everything voiceover believes in you. So thank you guys so much for listening. Once again, the Everything VoiceOver podcast is brought to you by The Voice Realm, where only professional voice actors are listed. Be sure to go to everythingvoiceover.com, check out our videos there, check out the other podcasts. We just finished up the Forging Your Path into VoiceOver two-part, four-part series. Um, yeah, yeah. Thank you guys so much for listening. Tune in next week for part two of the things nobody talks about in the voiceover industry. Take care. <laughs>